Hi. So, uh, I think we're ready to begin. Officially, there's no MC right now, so I'm just going to introduce myself. We're good. Do we need to shut the door in the back? Wow. Someone's got it. Great. Okay. Uh, my name is John Agnes. Um, I'm one of the happy hackers at Linotronics uh, in Germany. And I'm here to talk about uh, Print K. Uh, a slight disclaimer when I begin here. Uh, we're doing, actually, we're working on re-engineering a lot of Print K to address a lot of uh, long-standing problems. But none of the work that I am presenting here is mainline yet. Yeah, so we've been working on this for a, a year and a half already. But there is actually none of this in mainline yet. Lots and lots of patches and discussions on the mailing list. So it could actually end up being different than we see here as well. So the main thing about why is print K so complicated? Uh, isn't it just a function that just prints something? Uh, let's just maybe really quick take a look at what are the requirements actually of print K. So you have the basic requirements that print K can be called from any context, in scheduling context, NMI context, interrupt, hard interrupt uh, context. Uh, that's a requirement. These are simple requirements actually. Uh, it stores messages into a rig buffer. This ring buffer is then made available to user space, for example, syslog, dev k message. There's the k message dump facility so that if the machine crashes, it can actually grab those logs. And print k is also responsible responsible for pushing messages out onto the console, which might be a graphic screen or a serial or network, for example. So those are the simple requirements, actually. Here's where it starts to get complicated. So we also would like our print K to not be missing any messages if we crash or hang for any reason, right? So if we're crashing in bizarre contexts when we're holding certain spin locks or some other exotic locks, uh, it might be really hard to actually get those messages stored. So we might actually be missing some messages when the machine crashes. They might actually not be in the ring buffer even. We would also like that, con that the console doesn't miss any messages, right? So if my machine crashes, I would like to see what happened. Yeah, I don't want to be, I don't want to see nothingness, or I don't want there to be missing messages, right? So this is also really important. And the reason why this is so difficult is because the different console drivers uh, they do a lot of interesting stuff, you know, where they're not uh, thinking about that they might be, be being called from NMI context, for example. Yeah, they don't think about this when they write these drivers. Uh, things like the whole graphics subsystem or even doing the, the network console become really complicated if we're crashing in an NMI context, for example. How can we even get that stuff out? And then, of course, the big requirement, which is then the, the, the biggest one on the wish list, is we don't want print K to interfere the system at all. Right? So we want to see the messages immediately. We want them to be restored reliably from any context. Uh, but we also don't want them to disturb the system at all while we're running. Yeah? So if I stick in my USB stick, I shouldn't see latency spikes uh, because it's telling me the, the devices that are that were f uh, the different partitions that were found on my USB stick. But I still want to see those messages, right? When we put in our USB stick, we want to see those messages. We just don't want them to disturb our real-time applications that are running, for example. And if I'm allowed to quote myself, um, I actually wrote a while as a summary. Uh, if, it's in, if it's a part of print K, then it's already implicitly on every single line of code in the kernel. Because any line of code, of kernel in, uh, code in the kernel could potentially crash, which would cause print K to start doing stack traces and these kinds of things. So this is what makes print K so difficult, is it's everywhere. It's a very simple. A uh, function that a lot of people don't even like and try to avoid, but it's at the same time it goes very deep in the system. Yeah, and when our system crashes, now all of a sudden print K is very important to us. Now all of a sudden we start complaining, who wrote that and why is print K not working like this? Uh, so at the same time, it's a very important piece of the kernel. So I went through uh, to look at the history of print K just to see where it came from, and it turns out that print K has been around since the dawn of time. Right, so Linux 0.01. This is actually the contents of kernel slash print k dot c. So we see here that there's no ring buffer involved or anything like this. It's just directly sm print f or s print fing uh, the string into a temporary buffer. 
one kilobyte and then pushing that out to the TTY using assembly call. So it's a synchronous print K. And if we go through back to logs, now I, I'm only highlighting the ones, this is actually this list is only the things that I consider significant in the print K, print K history. And even from this list, I'm only going to be talking about a couple items uh, on this list because it's, it has a very long history. It's been there from, for almost 30 years now. So when we first started off in 91, we had this direct synchronous printing to the terminal. This is obviously something uh, that is very reliable. But in a modern system where we have lots of different CPUs that maybe want to print, obviously this solution would not work today in this form at least. Uh, not long later, we introduced the ring buffer, and this is mainly because we needed syslog support. Uh, syslog needs to be able to access the, the previous messages that we've already given out, so we need to log them. And uh, we also introduced kernel regi uh, I'm sorry, console registration, uh, which meant that if a console registers at some later point, then we need to spit out the messages that it's already missed. Right, so this is, and this is something we still do today. Right? So if the net console registers, you know, after a few seconds, then all the messages that the net console actually missed will get spit out over the net console. Log levels became in because once people, all these developers started working on Linux, they started adding all kinds of messages. And so the log levels came in there so we could reduce or increase that. The at some point, we decided we wanted to have more consoles, right? So at the beginning, we missed just a TTY, and then later we said, well, we could also do serial, uh, and later even came network. Uh, so we could use all these consoles at the same time. So we actually had support for multiple uh, consoles that could be registered. And the way it was implemented is, really, when a message came in from Print K, then we went through a for loop and just printed synchroni synchronously to every one of these consoles. Uh, and actually, that code still exists today. Yeah? that uh, for every single message, we go and we print to every registered console. Uh, we then start having problems that, okay, we needed some sort of protection because we added locking in there. Obviously, when SMP came onto the scene, uh, we need some sort of locking. And we had the problem, well, what if the lock is taken and now we crash, right? And so we in introduced a really great function called bus spin locks, which goes against everything that anyone has ever learned in computer uh, engineering. Uh, which basically says, well, if we're in a panic situation, then let's just forget the locks, right? They're not important anymore, right? Which the locks really do have a purpose, right? But we thought, okay, well, it's better than nothing, right? And then actually 10 years later, about the 10-year anniversary of Print K, uh, there was a big change that came in from Andrew in, in the 2.4 kernel where really it was really architect the architecture of Print K was changed quite a bit. There was this, this console sem, which was a semaphore that was brought in, uh, that replaced the, the lock, uh, there was a locking introduced for, for the uh, log buffer, and several other things. There was also, for example, an oops in progress global variable that was introduced, so the whole system could, could decide what to do in a panic situation. And uh, actually this is, if you look at the patch from back then, this is pretty much what Print K looks like now. This is actually a very significant overhaul of the Print K uh, design that still exists today, more or less. But what's significant here, which I've highlighted, is that this was the moment where print K became non-synchronous. So it, rather than for every print K, we print synchronously to every console, it was changed so that if somebody, if a print K comes in and someone else is already printing, then just let them print my message too, right? So uh, basically, that meant print K might go really fast if someone else is already doing the printing. Now, if you're the guy doing the printing, that's not going to be fun if all of a sudden all these people start doing print case. You're, you have a lot of work to do ahead of you. So a little bit later, we got dynamic allocating that came in uh, because before, up to this point, it was just a static buffer in the kernel. So now actually when the kernel boots uh, fairly early in the boot process, uh, it'll actually allocate memory dynamically and then move those messages over to the dynamic version. So you can have very large print K buffers if, buffers if you want. And at some point, we wanted this big kernel lock removed, the BKL, right? And uh, we weren't disabling interrupts while we were printing on the consoles, but we realized when we removed the BKL, all of a sudden, nothing worked anymore. So to work around that, we said, okay, well, if we're going to be calling the console drivers, then we need to disable interrupts. And this is because the drivers are doing all kinds of things. Uh, we just need to be safe and disable the interrupts there. Timing information came in. 
And here's what's really interesting. So now we're disabling the interrupts during the console printing, and we notice we're having these huge latency spikes because interrupts are disabled for a long time. When I'm printing a line on serial, it might be 9,600 uh, KBS or something, it takes a long time to print that line, and the interrupts are disabled for that huge thing. So what was our solution? Let's ignore the latency time if we're printing to the consoles, right? So uh, rather than uh, addressing the issue at that point, we just decide, well, let's just ignore those latencies uh, so that we can so we can track other latencies, right? But this doesn't make sense, really. I mean, if I have a real-time system and it has a huge latency, uh, and I'm like, well, why are the serial console isn't even showing up on my graphs? Well, it's because we're ignoring that latency secretly. The KDump interface showed up so that, you know, if a kernel crashes, we could actually get to the logs. Uh, and then here's what I call one of the first real big duct tape started to show in. Uh, keep in mind, we have registered consoles that are, that are registering later, and we need to reprint everything. But at that point, and still today, there is only one index that keeps track of where we are in this ring buffer. Right? So when someone else registers, and we need to replay the ring buffer, then what we do is we say, okay, this is now an exclusive console. We reset the index, we and we only print to this one console until we get back to there, and now we let everyone else print again. This works, of course, uh, but there are more elegant ways to handle multiple consoles, right? Okay. And uh, with 3.4, actually, with the push of systemd, uh, uh, there was a lot of re-engineering to printk. This is, I would call, the second major revision of printk. Uh, this is where we actually went from just a list of strings in a ring buffer to actual real structures that were variable length. Uh, we added sequence numbers, and we added the dev k message interface, read and write, so that the system D daemon could uh, directly access the print case stuff. <laughs> okay, so this, this anyway, this is a big, big change. And uh, the interesting thing is, is once we have sequence numbers, so we can actually number, which is a good thing, because if you have sequence numbers, now you can detect if you've dropped, like if we've lost some messages. Before, we didn't know uh, that we were dropping anything because they weren't numbered. So once we have sequence numbers, now we can detect that messages are being dropped. And what recently, 2006, 2016, uh, the idea of NMI, because until that point, we still couldn't really print from NMI context, right? Because print F's, or print K still tries to print to the consoles. If no one else is printing, then I need to do it. And if I'm in an NMI context, this isn't gonna work, right? So there was actually several iterations here of so you can actually see the evolution to the safe buffers. It actually came in 4.18 where we actually have safe buffers. These are special buffers set aside and if, an, if we want to print K from NMI context, we just copy it to those buffers, and then we trigger an IRQ work, and it's supposed to then copy it into the real uh, ring buffer under the lock. Uh, now, what happens when we crash? So we've got all these things sitting in these buffers. It hasn't been moved over yet, moved over yet, and we crash. Uh, then also we want to flush those buffers so we can see them when the machine uh, panics. Very recently, so last year, uh, there was a lot of work to add a console uh, owner and waiter concept. So this is, you know, we're coming up on 30 years, and finally we're like, okay, this one guy who's printing, if there's all these other people calling print Ks, and this one printer is stuck printing, then this, ja this, this CPU might just be printing for the rest of its life. Uh, no one else gets a chance to do anything, right? And so the, this new logic came in that says, if someone's printing, then I'm actually gonna take over the printing, right? So each person that prints is actually taking over from another, another task that might already be printing. And then finally, really new, is we have a feature called log cont, which means I can just do part, I can kind of build my message on the fly with multiple print K calls, and at some point flush that whole thing. Uh, that in, of it in and of itself is kind of a nightmare. But we actually, with the 5.0, we actually have a pretty good uh, idea of how to at least to coordinate whose partial messages are, messages are who. If we have two different CPUs that are doing partial messages, then it's we have to be able to coordinate, is this piece coming from him or is this piece coming from this guy? So with, with the 5.0, we actually have caller IDs now that we can tell who's printing what. So what are the open issues? We've done all these changes, we've added all these features, what are the current issues right now with printk? First of all, we have this uh, raw spin lock called lock buff that's protecting the lock buffer. 
Now, the log buffer, the ring buffer. Uh, the problem with that is it cannot be taken from NMI context at all times, right? Like, and when we're in NMI, we'll try to take it if it's, we'll do a try lock. If we get it, great, we can print. But if it's already locked, we still have to use the safe buffers, right? So we can't actually write into these, uh, into the ring buffer immediately. So now we get to the safe buffers. Uh, they have a problem that, for example, they're using bogus timestamps. So the timestamping is not happening when it goes into these safe buffers. The timestamps are happening when it actually makes it to the real ring buffer, right? Which might be considerably later. Yeah, so when we look at our D message, we see all these nice timestamps, but if any of those messages were coming from the safe buffers, those numbers are wrong. Yeah, so those actually is not the order that the things were happening, and you can't even sort it because the timestamps come much later. Uh, it relies on the IRQ work mechanism, which is fairly reliable, all, but there are situations where this might be the last thing the CPU ever does. Uh, if we don't print now, it's going to be lost. And then we have a little technical issue that, you know, I said that if we have a panic situation, we flush the safe buffers, but that's also not so trivial, and there are situations, for example, if we can't bring all the CPUs offline, then we don't flush. So there's actually quite a bit of situations where the safe buffers will not get flushed at all. The console drivers are a problem, that they're very slow, um, but really the problem is, is that we're calling them all with interrupts disabled, and we're calling them all together. Right, so we have five consoles, and we're going to do all five of them with interrupts disabled. Even if one of them's really fast and one of them's really slow, that we're going to do all five of them, and then we're going to re-enable uh, interrupts. Of course, the fact that we're ignoring interrupt latencies with the consoles, I don't have to say much about that. And we have a problem that the console drivers are just not reliable in a panic situation because they're not made for that. Yeah, if, if we're panicking in an NMI context, the drivers just won't help us. Another issue. Uh, we're treating info messages exactly the same as emergency message, right? So that message that just says um, our dev random is finally ready with real random data is exactly as important as we just resolved a null pointer, right? Uh, which means we're keeping these, at the we're handling them exa exactly the same, which means are we tr do we treat, treat them both as an emergency or do we treat them both as informational? But the whole handling of this, you know, it's obviously one is more important than the other. It's nice that the, that the random is re it's ready, but it would, I would prefer to get the information that we just did a null pointer. I already mentioned that uh, you know, we've improved this, that you know, every time that someone does a print K, he, this task takes over the printing task, right? So that printing task is finally re re relieved and, it's and someone else can come along. The problem is, is when I'm the last guy, I get to do the rest, right? So you know, if there's like, you know, 50, 60 print Ks that have been, uh, you know, stacking up there and all of a sudden I'm the last one, I might actually have a lot of stuff that I need to, to print there, right? So that's, it's not fun to be the last guy in that situation. So although this did really relieve a lot of real situations, it's it was very helpful to, to hand off the print King, uh, but if you're the last one, uh, it's no fun. And this actually makes it a big wild card for callers of print K. You know, if I'm in certain contexts, I might be afraid of using print K. Because am I gonna, is it going to be expensive or is it going to be cheap? I, I don't even know. It depends on the ordering and if I was the last task to do the printing. And the last major open issue is the fact that we have this oops in progress global variable, which is kind of uh, politely requesting drivers to ignore their locks. And we also have a bus spin locks function that uh, explicitly tells print K to ignore its locks. And uh, uh, it's my opinion that we are a lot of brilliant people, and after 30 years of print K, there has to be a way to better way to do this than to just ignore locks, uh, because it actually doesn't work in a lot of situations. So the problem, you know, after looking at this, I looked at all these issues, I looked at the history, and I said, what is the main issue here? Uh, and the main issue that I got out of this is we have a tug of war going on. We want this non-interference, you know, that we can just print K whatever as much, we can just be d in a loop of just print King, we don't want it to disturb the system, and at the other time, at, at the same time, if it crashes, we want this information now, right? And these are two requirements that are actually working against each other. And so what happens is we end up with a solution that's not good for both sides, right? So we're both tug of warring and this side's not happy and that side's not happy and we just got something kind of in the middle. And I was, uh, kind of inspired by Randall Monroe, 
uh, who wrote an article about tug of war, and he said in the ultimate game of tug of war, the only winning move is not to pull. Right? So we need to remove this that we have print K fighting with itself. Do I want to be uh, non-interference or I want to be reliable? And really, if the only th purpose of my talk really is this, right? So we'll go into some solutions. But really this idea of we need to get out of this mindset that print K has to do both sides equally, right? We need to, we need to have this, we need to handle these things separately. So what does it mean to not pull, right? And it turns out if you look at what print K is doing, and then if you ask yourself the question, what is it printing and when is it printing, then you can start to see actually we can actually divide these two countering requirements. Right, so for example, when I'm crashing, when there's worn ons happening, uh, things like this, these are, these are situations that we know about. We know that it's happening, right? They're, they're being triggered and we're calling into the bug function, right? So it knows that there's something serious going on, as opposed to someone who's just uh, printing uh, random information about the USB or whatever. Uh, so the fact that what we're printing and when we're printing it, for example, if also if I'm in a panic situation, that's also a when, then the things in there are extremely important. So we can kind of start to partition this and to see there's actually two different types of scenarios there. And so really my solution is, or my recommendation, what I'm trying to push, is that we split this into two problems with two different solutions. So the first problem is the non-interference one. And so what I'm really trying to push is to make print K fully preemptible, right? So we do this first of all with a uh, all context safe ring buffer. So we need to get away from this raw spin lock that's sitti sitting around the protecting the ring buffer. This will give us the freedom that we can just, it doesn't matter what context we're in, we can just insert those messages into the ring buffer, right? So this will help us, this non-interference that we don't have to do special locks or we're, you know, causing extra IRQ works or anything like this, we could just throw it in there and it's in there. The second thing is, is that we go to per console K threads. And I'll go into these things in a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides. Now, K threads have been uh, tried in the past. But in my opinion, the problem was the past attempts at using K threads is they didn't try to separate the critical messages for the non-critical message. They still, they try to do everything with the K thread. So you're not really solving the problem, you're just moving it into K threads which is not necessarily helpful. So the other problem which we want to solve, which is a separate problem, is reliability. And the idea was that we provide an official synchronous channel where we can put important messages. For example, when the machine is crashing, panic situation, bugs. And we use this other channel, this synchronous channel, when we want to get out, get this, this, get this information out. So this also will make use of the all context safe ring buffer. Uh, that can be used at any time so we can get those messages in the ring buffer all the time. This is really important because there are a lot of interfaces in the kernel, for example, the k-message dump interface, where other callbacks need to get, will just grab those messages from the ring buffer. So it's really important that we at least get those in the ring buffer. We need the all context safe ring buffer for both s scenarios. Uh, but for the reliability scenario, we're also going to have atomic consoles, which is something that I'm going to talk about in a minute, and something called emergency messages. So first let's talk about the ring buffer, which we need for both. They both need this. Uh, even though it's not, the, the problems are being solved separately, but both problems need this thing. Uh, the first iteration was something that was using a CPU lock. And this uh, ring buffer uh, can be called from any context. Uh, it supports multiple readers and a single writing CPU. Right? So when I say writing CPU, it means uh, if, I, if the CPU is writing and then there's an NMI on the CPU, that CPU can also continue to write, right? But another CPU would actually have to uh, wait for the CPU to finish. Uh, it stores all data contiguously in memory, exactly like the current print K, and it's a relatively simple implementation. And uh, we're not gonna go into this, but actually if you go to the website from Linux Plumbers and you download my slides, there's like 10 slides after my thank you slide that show a lot of pictures and a lot of details. So if you're really interested in how we're implementing this, uh, it's a lot of detailed information, but unfortunately, I don't have enough time here for that. Now, the implementation is using the CPU lock, which is actually a CPU reentrant spin lock, which means if a CPU grabs the spin lock and the owner of that spin lock is, is the same CPU, 
then I also get it, right? So it's, uh, you're allowed to re-grab that spin lock if it's on the CPU, same CPU. And we use this to serialize the writers. And there's also in the appendix uh, the code to show you what the CPU lock looks like in code. Uh, what this ring buffer also does is it uses logical positions to avoid an ABA problem. So if you have a, you know, a ring buffer that's only four kilobytes large and it wraps around, we're, we're lockless now. So if, if reader, a reader might say, okay, I want to read this message, and maybe the reader blocked for a couple seconds. And then when I actually came time to read it, maybe that ring buffer's wrapped three times since then, right? So it's reading the position, but it's actually a totally wrong message. And so rather than just ra using an index into a buffer, it's actually uh, just a logical position that just keeps going on so that we have an actual unsigned long that has to wrap before that to hap for that uh, ABA problem. The only real concerns about this version uh, was that the CPU lock has kind of a big kernel lock feel to it. Uh, you can only have one in the system. If you have more than one in your system, you can actually uh, really easily create deadlocks. So we have uh, the kind of start to feel like BKL already, just we only have one. And if you're going to be doing any NMI locking in uh, at all, so for example, if, I if there's a chance that one NMI context is going to wait for, an up an for another CPU, uh, then you're also going to have a problem. So the NMI contexts are also required to use this global CPU lock. Right? So it kind of has a BKA feel to it uh, when you're talking about NMI context and synchronizing the log. Yeah, it should never, but it's done in the past, and the concerns are, what if it does it again in the future, right? So then, uh, to get around this situation, uh, I was asked by Petter, the, who's the maintainer of Print K, uh, well, can we do this without that CPU lock? And actually, I happen to have one in my pocket because I was kind of working on a lockless version anyway. And so I was like, okay, well, let's try that. And so I actually created a new version, a different version of the ring buffer, and this one was truly lockless, so it doesn't grab any locks whatsoever. It supports multiple readers, multiple writers, uh, all contexts, and the raw record data is stored contiguously. So there's some information that's not stored contiguously, but uh, basically all of the print K messages themselves are all stored continuously, just like the current implementation. The way it works is it uses descriptors to store the metadata. So we actually have we have the ring buffer itself, which has the raw data, and there's actually a separate structure that uses descriptors to describe where the records are located in there. Uh, in order to simplify this, I actually factor this into three different structures. So it uses something called a num list, which is just a numbered list, and the job of the number list is to sequence the records. Uh, it has a data ring buffer, which is just a, the basically a primitive ring buffer, very similar to the version from 1992 to just track the raw data as, uh, as the records, individual records. And then it uses a high level print K ring buffer structure, which basically provides the interface to the ring buffer. So it's using the data ring and the num list to provide a coherent reader writer interface to support all of the features of print K that we, are, that we now have to support. Uh, to avoid the ABA problem, uh, it also used logical positions for the data ring and the number list, the num list, which is actually a link list, uh, uses node IDs rather than pointers, because with pointers you can very quickly also get into the ABA problem. So what was the problem with this one? It was complicated. Uh, doing a pure lockless multi-reader, multi-writer was not easy, and there's still, in my opinion, ongoing research on this topic. Uh, I had the three different data structures. There was multiple writer variables that were shared between C that could be shared between CPUs, which means oops, which means you're left with nine memory barrier pairs. So basically, we have 18 memory barriers in this stuff, which is becomes first of all difficult to document uh, because we don't really have a formalized method of documenting our memory barriers. So we have we've done a lot of stuff in the direction of memory barriers uh, and proving them. Uh, but the documentation, the kernel is still kind of do whatever you want. And when you've got 18 of them, do whatever you want is not so easy. Uh, and obviously, it's difficult to re review. So we've got these, we've got the data list, uh, the data ring, the, the num list. Uh, we've got the 18 memory barriers in there. And it's difficult for other people to prove or to believe that what I've done is actually correct. And uh, if the situation came up or the question came up, do we really need multi-writer support anyway, right? If, can we just, the, the CPU lock version actually was qu quite simple. 
right? The difference between the CP lock version and this version uh, was really that this is multi-writer and that one's not. And if we don't really need that, then maybe it's not worth all of this extra effort. Okay, ring buffer. So we've got the two ring buffers there. Let's move on to the next one. It gets a little bit, little bit easier, maybe. So if we get to the topic of non-interference that we want to solve, uh, I propose doing per console kernel threads. And the advantage of this is we can totally decouple the print K callers from the console, right? So when someone calls print K, that context is not actually printing. All they're doing is throwing it into a ring buffer and they're done, right? And there's actually a lot of advantages to that because uh, there's a lot of co crazy locks, for example, the console lock that's involved in print K callers. And print K callers if, if don't want to deal with that con those consoles. They don't need to deal with them at all. Why should they have to? They we're talking about non-interference here. They're just trying to get a message into the ring buffer, right? So let's decouple print K from the console completely. Uh, by doing this, we can now have inter individual iterators per console. So every console thread is just keeping track of where it is, uh, which means that if I have a really fast console, it can get the messages out quickly, and if I have a slow one, it's going slow, but the slow console is not affecting the fast console, right? So maybe on the network console, I'm actually seeing that uh, ftrace dump, and I'm not missing anything. And on the serial console, I'm missing like 90% of the messages, but it doesn't matter. The way it is right now, they all miss 90% of the messages, which is cr just insane, right? We've got these fast consoles, and they're, they're being tied to a stone because they're dragging a serial console with them, right? So you know, we can let them go fast. Uh, there was also some patches floating around about individual log levels per console. And this, in this situation, that would also be very good because we could say, so if I have a fast console, let it log a lot. If I have a slow console, let's have it log a little bit. You know, we can, we can play with these things. And then obviously features like the exclusive console, which is really, in my opinion, a real piece of duct tape, they just disappear on their own. Every console has their own iterator. They always start at the beginning and they just dump everything that there is, right? They're not affected by each other. So it, it makes a lot of sense in a lot of levels. So what are the concerns about this? First of all, obviously, what happened with the, what's with the console lock? We can't just ignore it and throw it away. The console lock does serve a purpose. Uh, one of the ideas from me was that we could turn it into something similar to a read-write lock, where we have lots of readers that are allowed to, to go in there. In this case, it would be the console K threads. Or for the people that are not part of print K, so for example, as far as I'm aware of the DRM, the whole graphic infrastructure, they're also taking the console lock. If they take it, okay, then we'll keep all of our readers out of it. But as soon as they're done with it, then we can go ahead and let all our readers go back in and get in there, work with the consoles. What we could also possibly do is use a per console lock, which in my opinion would be sufficient because as far as I know, the graphics, light, the, the graphics people that are using this console semaphore they're basically just using it as some sort of special locking for their TTYs or whatever, their displays. So really, if, they each, if each console has its own lock, in my opinion, that would be sufficient, but we need to look at it in detail. Print K itself doesn't need this. The, cons the consoles themselves don't need this, but there are other people using this stuff. Uh, because really, at the end, the Print K should not care about the console at all. They're just dumping messages to the ring buffer, right? Uh, the other concern is, is can we rely on K-Threads for console printing? And my answer is, uh, that's not what we're trying to solve here. The K-Threads are not solving the reliability problem. People need to, s to stop thinking that. Yeah, stop thinking it as one problem and thinking of it as two problems. The K-Threads are solving uh, the issue of non-interference, right? There's other things that we'll see in the slides about solving the, uh, the reliability. So if we can learn to stop pulling on each other, then we can actually start focusing, how can we make the reliability solution more reliable? How can we make the non-interference solution more, more non-interfering, right? If we go to reliability, uh, I introduced something called atomic consoles. That's a new special callback in the console structure called write atomic. It's basically like an uh, early print K, but it's safe. Yeah, so we have early print K implementations for drivers uh, but they're not, they're not safe. They just kind of just overwrite the registers and don't worry about anything. Uh, that's not going to work if two, of, if two different CPUs are doing that at the same time. All right, so let's create an atomic callback to really allow consoles to actually implement on their driver uh, a writing that is truly atomic, that can be called from any context. Um, sorry, 
uh, it also uh, goes into atomic consoles are also synchronous. So if I'm going to do an atomic write, then I'm actually going to sit there in that atomic write until it's done. This is kind of going back to the roots of print k, 001, where you're actually sitting there until it's out there. Right? So we're, we want to be reliable. I'm not just going to throw it in there and hope someone else printed it. No, I'm going to sit there and I'm going to print it. And I'm going to stay sitting here until it's printed. Uh, by doing that, we can actually ignore the console lock altogether because we're doing something special there, right? So we're doing something atomic, and the drivers are the ones that are going to have to implement this, right? So if I have a driver and I have the write function and I have the write atomic function, then it's my responsibility as the driver author to make sure that those two things are synchronized. And actually, you can use the CPU lock to do this. Now, we don't want to use this reliability atomic consoles for everything. Because obviously, if I'm going to sit in there and block until it's done, this is really going to slow my system down. This is going to be major uh, interference on general level, right? But we're not, this is not dealing with interference. This is dealing with reliability. And so really, well the only things we want to re be reliable are the critical messages, not all the messages, right? So the only thing we really want to be printing are the emergency messages, which we'll see in the next in two slides. Um, What's also nice about when, because uh, preempt RT is going mainline, uh, which means that the spin locks that the different console drivers are taking are not actually spin locks, they can actually sleep, uh, which means uh, if we've got these atomic consoles that are available for preempt RT, then we can actually still do this reliability through the atomic writes, but the normal writes can still be sleeping spin locks, and we don't have to worry about anything uh, reg regarding latencies of console drivers, right? So this... Yeah, it makes sense for everybody, right? So uh, really there's, yeah. But the, the difference is in RT, they're not actually spin locks, they're disabling interrupts. Uh, so we, we can actually, if we w when we get to this ignoring of the latencies, uh, then we can actually do that. Because the drivers are still doing spin lock RQ safe, right? That the code is there, right? So only in the preempt RT is that not actually disabling interrupts. Uh, anyway, if we ha when we have these uh, atomic consoles, then we also don't need these special ops in progress that's supposed to be evaluated by the different drivers to do something special, and we don't need to ignore our locks because we have a function available to just write. Now the concerns with the at atomic co uh, consoles are how many drivers could we actually implement to be atomic? Uh, in my first release, Canada, I implemented the 8250 UART uh, as an example, but it was not trivial. It, you have to be really careful there uh, to synchronize that, and you have to make use of the CPU lock. And uh, basically the way it worked is, for example, when writing the serial, uh, we're using the CPU lock to synchronize per character and we're using the CPU lock per line for the emergency for the emergency messages, right? So it, the, the serial is allowed to do one character at a time, which is just putting on the FIFO, that's really fast. And then, but if a whole line comes along, then we can actually inter interrupt that at the, uh, the, at the atomic level and do an entire line. There was also the question of, uh, can a, something be done for systems without atomic consoles? Because, you know, let's face it, people have to write these atomic write function everywhere, and uh, maybe they can't figure it out, or it just doesn't exist. So there were some different ideas floating around about how we'll, we can help these systems that actually don't have atomic consoles. Uh, for example, Linus recently threw up the idea uh, that we could throw things into a, a, a separate memory variable and a reliable address, and when the system reboots, maybe we can still read that area. And there's actually some tests around, and amazingly, after you reboot your system, you can actually, in many situations, read most of that memory again. So that might be something that could be interesting. Uh, we could try some things like trying to print synchronously if we're uh, not in an atomic context, assuming we can even detect that, or we could fall back to the craziness of that we're doing today. In my opinion, we, we really need to split this and we need to start handling our separate solutions and let people start to deal with, with the atomic console problem. Uh, but you know, rea reality is a different situation, so we still have to decide on that. Yeah, but the, the thing is right now we, we have a mindset that we think something must work for all consoles or it can't work for any, which is wrong because they are hardware from the hardware side totally different. And 
So uh, a lot of machines still have serial in the data centers in or boxes which developers use. And so we, a lot of people, including me and Peter and who else, has random hacks to make it work, even if the thing crashes in NMI. So, but that's not a solution. So we really sh should understand and should accept that there is hardware which can provide atomic rights and there's hardware which can't. Mm -hmm. And we can solve the problem with, with, with the, the, the graphics stuff mm -hmm. at all. I mean, unless there's a switch in the graphics uh, device where you say, I write into this and now the hardware itself or the firmware in there switches reliably to VGA mode. And then Although they are working on this actually right now. Yeah. I, think they'll, I think they'll make it too. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but this is the only way how this can be solved. Uh, I was recently cruising about that whole thing because I was trying to debug something which we needed a laptop to debug. So it never made anything to any screen. So it just doesn't work. What's the memory that you're working on? Uh, that discussion came up after after I actually figured it out <laughs> what, what what was broken. But uh, I mean, so but but for a lot of my other work, I have consoles which allow um, atomic. So the the, the, the the word console can uh, can be sure. atomic. Sure. But there, I mean, there are a lot that don't as well. So yeah. So a shout out to all the hardware people. Awesome stuff like a USB debug port do not work in the atomic console. So it's useless. Right. So, so the, the extra memory which derives the need to do that, that's great. Or that quick flip in the graphics card, mm. which yeah. still has the graphics problem, but it's called too fast. And I, and I think that once the kernel officially provides an interface, right? We officially say we want to do this split. Right. Then it becomes more interesting for drivers. And we have a lot of brilliant people out there that'll actually figure out how to make things work atomic or there'll be new hardware people doing things atomic. But right now we're just paper taping over everything um, and no one's doing anything about it except for screaming when it doesn't work. <laughs> so the last thing uh, on the list of things is emergency messages. Uh, which means that at any point we can have certain messages that we're sending into the print K infrastructure uh, that we're tagging for immediate and synchronous printing. Obviously the concerns here are what is considered important. So my first version uh, actually used the log level, uh, but, but that's pretty hard to do, but it works. But the log level is kind of a gray area. What's, you know, is warning really warning or not? Or, you know, are people misusing that? So, you know, there are other ideas from me that maybe log level, I've I'm kind of the impression that log level is not the way to go. Uh, there, there's only certain situations, you know, bug, warn, oops, panic, you know, just have, let's just ha maybe have the developers decide what's really important. Uh, with the things we're sending mainline for when a thing crashes and we can just use the atomic rights for that. Uh, another option is maybe that the cons console drivers themselves should somehow decide. I'm not sure about this, but you know, for example, what, what Linus pro, uh, you know, offered that we could have, you know, a memory area, we want everything to kind of go in there, then that's kind of the, the console, the special console that's deciding that. Uh, or maybe the user should decide, maybe we should be using log level threshold and we just need to clean up our log levels, right? Uh, because maybe a user says, I don't care, I want everything synchronous, right? Or they say, no, I just want certain types of messages to be synchronous. I don't know, this, this is, like I've said, I've done implementation with log level, and we get it to work, but system D likes to play with log levels a lot, so it's hard to, to kind of get that filtered. Yeah, ignore log, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of running out of time here, so I'm just gonna kind of finish up really quick. Uh, so the status until now, you see this began uh, way back in February of 2018. Uh, my last post was the RFC version four uh, last month and we're still discussing on the things there. Uh, in particular, uh, it's still some things that they think that, that it's considered too complicated uh, that we need to sort out. Uh, one thing to note is, is that the RFC version one, which is using the CPU lock uh, ring buffer is actually part of the preempt series since uh, 503. So the, the RT people are actually already switched over. 
uh, but that's using a different ring buffer than I'm currently posting, so I don't know. Um, looking forward, I'm just going to kind of put down, these are the steps that we've kind of outlined how we want to continue. Um, we want to start off by replacing the, the mainline ring buffer, just kind of go slowly. Um, then we will need to fix the log continuous that actually works NMI safe. Then we can remove that log buff lock, remove the safe buffers, uh, introduce per console threads, maybe something similar to thread IRQs now to kind of let people kind of migrate into it. They can, at, at the beginning, they can actually choose if they want to have it or not. Um, we're going to have to decide the emergency messages thing. And uh, yeah, the right atomics we're also going to need. So. Anyway, the point thing here is, is this is not just a huge to-do list. Actually, RFC1 implemented like 95% of this, right? So it's, there is actual code there. Maybe it can't be used as it was with the RFC version 1, but there is a, you can do a lot of testing. It is in the preempt RT patch set, uh, and we can actually you know, really see how these things work, if they are really as reliable as we think they are, and if they're as non-interfering as, non as we think they are. Uh, really quick, thanks to a lot of people that gave me an enormous amount of support uh, working on this. Uh, there's no way I could have done this myself. Print K is way too big. It's coming up, it's approaching 30 years old, uh, and that's just, uh, it's got a lot of history. And also to the Linux Foundation for helping us bring preempt RT mainline. We probably don't have time for questions, but maybe if there's one or two good ones. Otherwise, I'm happy to talk about this all day outside. Oh. So uh, how about uh, the trace, the tracing uh, printing? Uh, the F-trace, uh, yeah. F-trace, yes. Yeah, so actually I tried to use F-trace in the beginning. F-trace has two problems. Uh, first of all, it's designed for per CPU usage. So, which means we're gonna have to create large buffers on every single CPU, uh, even though we may not be using 90% of those buffers, right? So if I have 128 CPUs and everyone's getting a megabyte, maybe we don't care, maybe that is okay. So that's the one issue, is that we can't, we can't efficiently use that, those buffers. The second issue is that uh, F-trace is not lockless for reading. So the non-consuming readers in F-trace do have to take locks, right? So that's also not acceptable. So that, that was a, another problem that I had. So with those two issues, uh, it was decided that I should spend my effort just making a print case specific ring buffer rather than using F-trace. And this, by, by the way, this buffer is not interesting for F-trace because of the fact that it's a global shared buffer, right? So F-trace is optimized to be per CPU. Uh, also, the, all the cache alignment and everything it's doing is really great so that we're not, you know, it's, the CPUs aren't killing each other. Uh, whereas this one, we have a global thing. So I, I'm only, I've done tests and it takes about, uh, on a modern ARM64, you know, one and a half microseconds per print K into that ring buffer. And F-trace can go about six times that speed, right? So it's considerably slower than F-trace, but it also supports different things than F-trace. So, so would it make sense to kind of uh, make it configurable in some way so that for some, in some cases we would like to have uh, use uh, F-trace for, uh, or F-trace-like semantics for print K so that we can have one framework instead of two for printing? I mean that we surely can at some point experiment with that. But I, at the moment, I would go for keep it simple first. Make it work, solve the problems we have, and then introduce new ones. Not the other way around. I agree with that. Yes. Any other questions? So we're just missing lunch. We're just be missing the beginning of lunch right now, so no one has to panic about missing um, anything. So missing the long uh, lines. This is very impressive. This is uh, very. I see you put a lot of effort in it, and I'm curious who pays you for that and why exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, as I said, it's great, but what? Wh why? Why you employed? Pay uh, for that? Right. So, so we I are. I don't know why I employed him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, d I don't know why. Either. I uh, I'm happy that he did though. Um, so we, this actually initially, this whole effort became part of the umbrella from the Linux Foundation trying to bring uh, print in real time. Uh, but we've actually extended beyond what that funding could give. So it was initially, I think we thought it would take a month, right? <laughs> and so, you know, there's a lot of my own personal private time, my own interest. I mean, I've got my, I have my name out there. I'm working on this. I also want to see it working. I'm a big real time fan, so I want it to work. Uh, and the end maintainers, uh, you know, like 
uh, Peter, who's spending weeks, and now Peter, who's, who's doing all kinds of reviews, there's no one really paying for that. But that's, I mean, we're kind of, we get to do it during work, I guess, sometimes. But uh, yeah, there's, I'm not getting paid full time to work on this, for sure not, uh, because it, it's way too expensive. <laughs> it's, it's, there's so much uh, stuff, especially with the memory barriers. I really encourage people to, to download this and look at the following slides that in the appendix uh, that really go into the memory barriers. And the doc there's just so much stuff there. I think when we started doing this, we didn't realize how much baggage that we would have to go into. There's so much history, so many requirements, and it, it really is a quite complicated topic. So, uh, yeah, but I'm happy to, to improve the world, right? So it's, uh, <laughs> it's okay. I love Linux. Any in the back? Did you throw your box to the corner? Uh, so since you you're introducing emergency messages, uh, doesn't that necessarily mean that you can that um, th those might be out of sequence uh, as they're printed? C if you have some non-emergency messages that happened before, yes. Okay. But the timestamps are all accurate. Oh, so the timestamps are when they when they're. When yes, when so the reason why the timestamps right now are not accurate is because of the safe buffers. But once we have a lockless ring buffer, then we can just, we can put those in right now, right? Okay. So all the timestamps are accurate. So, I, so uh, going back to your example, if like a USB drive is plugged in, and then um, I was thinking, well, what would happen if that caused a panic in itself? You'd, you would get some messages out of sequence, but you would see, you would s eventually see all of them. And, and From the timestamp. Yeah, for example, like yeah. a worn on or something, right? So an, a worn on comes right away, maybe you see that. And then you see a bunch of messages that actually came before that, yeah. but it came th that was printed synchronously, and the other things were printed by the K thread, which maybe got scheduled afterwards, right? Okay. But the, the timestamps are there. Also, uh, you mentioned um, uh, th this RAM buffer. Um, that is, I I'm not sure if that's necessarily a new idea because we've had uh, RAM loops for a while. Um, Ye uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I don't know. Linus just talked about it last uh, two weeks ago or something. No, it was so more about it. having it on the machines which do not have persistent RAM buffers, which is Joe uses laptop, and that's what we care about because that's what we can't debug right now because we lose all the information. Uh, so and there was some experiment how much DRAM actually retains information over a reset uh, or even over a power off, which is impressive. So but of course, what we really want, and we were asking for that for 20 plus years now, and not getting it from the hardware uh, of people, is actually persistent storage for exactly that purpose. Uh, Maybe we, if, if it's there, is if the, the persistent storage exists on the hardware, it's just a matter of writing a console driver which writes out to that thing. And with that split, that console driver can write out anything and can uh, even write out synchronous all the time. So that's the, that's the interesting change to the current mode, to the current mode which just treat everything the same way. Now when we switch over to something which is really useful, like persistent, persistent storage, which, which, is, which has no limitations in locking or whatever, we just can write out to it and be done with it. So that's where, w where we want to go. And so I mean, the, the, the EFIP store that you have. No, EFIP store does not count. EFIP store is um, mm. P store. Uh, no, um, it doesn't work. But it would be nice to have something integrated into Print K, right? So if we're using these kind of things, and the machine does just reboot, and then all those messages are put right back into the ring buffer, right? So my machine crashes, I don't see anything, but I hit reset, and I come back up, and now I can demessage, and I see them all, like something like that, like an integrated solution would be nice. And and we're back to your initial question about ordering. I mean, if there is an emergency, we really want to see the emergency, and that's the most important thing we need to get out because, in a lot of situations where the machine is actually crashing, the most important thing you need to get is the, is the backtrace. And, and pardon? And the register. And the register dump, yeah. The less interesting part is all the, 
oh, I loaded 5,000 gazillion modules and <laughs> things like that, but anyway, it's there. So, but the, 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 the thing right now, we often do not get the backtrace out of the, out of, out, out of the print K, we just are lost in something. And that's especially true when the, in, when the crash happens right while the driver, while loading print case, and then the interrupt hits crashes because the driver was not yet fully initialized, and then you just lock up the machine and be done with it. And that's what we want to get away with. And everything after that is nice to have. Any other questions? Oh, here we go. Um, so I was wondering if there's an agreed approach for cases where you print out a ton of stuff over print K, but too much for PR is constantly reasonable. Like, if particular nasty things happen, you can get an oops on multiple CPUs at the same time, and then it's difficult to deinterleave that. Um, one approach might be you add a CPU number or some context on the print K lines, but that might break it. Yeah, we actually have that now since 5.0. It's called the caller ID. We do have and that. It's, it's okay. beautiful. When you print that out, you see exa if, it's, if you're in a task context, you see the, the thread ID. If you're in some sort of scheduling or NMI or something, you see the CPU ID. And you can sort all of those out. They can all dump at the same time. You yeah. Just grab that output, sort it, and you, you have your stack traces. It's beautiful, actually. Good. Solve problem. That's uh, <laughs> yeah. really nice. Yeah, the color ID, I was really excited to see that come in. That just came in to 5, no, five zero, And it was a big, but you have to turn it on. It's not turned on by default. So turn on color ID. It's really good. Yeah, that's the, that's the only part of print K I like right now. Any other questions? Any other scores? Any other things? <laughs> Great, then thank you for your attention and uh, <laughs> have fun. Oh, good